glory, and inspiration 24 hours a day. UBM Praise Chicago, a service of the UBM Networks. The following show is paid programming and does not necessarily express the views and opinions of Urban Broadcast Media and its subsidiaries. Thank you for listening to UBM Praise. Let's go. Sir Walter Jones. Who is it? Sir Walter Jones. What's his name? Sir Walter Jones. Who show is this? Sir Walter Jones. Who is it? Sir Walter Jones. Say it again. Sir Walter Jones. Who are you with? Sir Walter Jones. One more again. Sir Walter Jones. The Sir Walter Jones Show. Co-host Alvin Carter. We are a Christian talk show in where we tackle all the hot topics in a believer's walk. A Sir Walter Jones. Who is it? A Sir Walter Jones. What's his name? A Sir Walter Jones. Who show is this? A Sir Walter Jones. Proverbs 18 and 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and is safe. Got a question about scriptures? The word of God is powerful. Often misunderstood. But with proper study, you can gain accurate application of this potent source of life here on the Sir Walter Jones Show. Speak, Lord. Speak to me. Yes, yes. Speak to me. Speak to me. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Sir Walter Jones. What a beautiful song to play. Speak to me. And what is this? Whatever it is, it's changed my life. And it has made me whole. Um, I'm here at the studio uh, standing in for my brother, Sir Walter Jones. Him not here, him somewhere else. And so I'm flying solo. This is a first for me. So you all going to have to bear with me. He talks about this is the Bible. The B-I-B-L-E, which is basic instructions before leaving Earth. I'm trying to stream live on Facebook, but I'll have to figure out what's going on 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 there. And I'm periscoping at the same time. What's up, Periscope? And what's up, Facebook Live? Let's see how this can be done. And can I do many things (laughs) at the same time? All right. We're getting ready to go into a very interesting topic. Our topic of discussion on today is the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, a very unique thing, a very unique topic that one would talk on. The Holy Ghost. What is he? Who is he? What is he not? Uh, Is it a he? Should we call him a he or is he a it or what is it? That we're supposed to call him. Does he even exist? Is he working in our church today? The Holy Ghost. And then is he just a tongue? Is it uh, speaking a tongue? Is that what the Holy Ghost is all about? It's a good question. And is it Holy Spirit or is it Holy Ghost? Is there a difference in the two? Should we call him one or the other? And, and while I'm on there, I do recognize that there are some cultural people who call him Holy Spirit. Some call him Holy Ghost. And some says, uh, no, he's not called the Holy Ghost. We call him the Holy Spirit. Or some would say, when I grew up, he was called the Holy Spirit. Now you all want to change it to the Holy Ghost. So is it the Holy Ghost? Or is it the Holy Spirit? Are they one and the same or what? And then... There's a good question. Is the Holy Ghost just a spirit? Is he a force? Is he just a force spirit? Or is the Holy Ghost a God? Should we pray to him? Uh, Is he a person? So there is a statement of faith in the body of Christ that says that we believe that there is one God eternally existing in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, or God the Holy Spirit. So we do know uh, that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. He is also the Spirit of Christ. Now, when I grew up as a young child, we always heard about the Holy Ghost. The preachers constantly preached about it, 
and then uh, the mothers would have us on the on the altar tarrying for the Holy Ghost because they wanted us to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Which brings me to another question. Am I saved if I'm not baptized with the Holy Ghost? And I think what happens at time we get kind of confused on baptism of the Holy Ghost or being born again. If you look at what uh, John the Baptist said in the third chapter, I believe, of John, or even in Matthew, when Jesus was being baptized by John the Baptist, he says that he's coming. I'm not worthy to unlatch his shoe. He says, I baptize you with water. But there comes someone who's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. So right off the bat, that tells me that Jesus baptizes us with the Holy Ghost. But 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 lets us know that the Holy Ghost baptizes us into the body of Christ. In other words, you got saved. When you got saved, the Holy Ghost baptized you into the body of Christ. You became a believer. You became a born-again, blood-washed, saved, regenerated person with a new life. Then the Holy Ghost saved you, and he sanctified you, and he prepared you for another phase in your life, of which phase Jesus steps into the picture, and then he baptizes you with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, at the same time, you all see that I'm not only uh, periscoping, but I'm also doing a Facebook Live. And I got my notes before me. So let's go into the notes. Uh, and, and before I go into the notes, uh, there's some other questions that I would like to address. Uh, does the Holy Ghost have a distinctive work? Does he have a distinctive work that he does in this day and time, does the Holy Ghost have a distinctive work that he does in this day and time, or is he just a spirit? Uh, I was speaking with someone the other day, and they said that the Holy Ghost was just a force. And I beg to differ, as my dad would say with you, the Holy Ghost is not just a force. He is God, the Holy Spirit. So, number one, is the Holy Ghost a thing? Should we call him a it or what? Now, I got so many things going on at the same time. This is what I'm going to do. Uh, I have to put my uh, periscope in the other hand. All right. Let's deal with is it the Holy Spirit or is it the Holy Ghost? All right. Is there a difference? Facebook is there a difference? Type in there yes or no. Periscope, type in there yes or no. Is there a difference in Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit? Is it the Holy Ghost or is he the Holy Spirit? Which one do we call him or does it make a difference in the two? All right. While you're typing that in, the answer is no. There is no difference in Holy Ghost and Holy Spirit because it both come from a Greek word called pneuma. Pneumatology is the study of the Holy Spirit. Uh, as a carpenter, I have a tool called a pneumatic gun, which means it, it's operated by the blast of air. So the Greek word pneuma is the same word for ghost, for spirit, for blast, or for breath. So when God breathed the breath of life into man, that was the word pneuma, which is the same word. So Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost is the same Greek word. I think culturally speaking, one culture says Holy Spirit. Another culture says Holy Ghost. It's the same thing. He is considered as the Holy Ghost or and the Holy Spirit. Now, I'll say this, there are times in the Bible where the Bible interchanges them. He uses the same term or different terms in the same scripture. Let's go to Luke. Get your Bibles, Facebook. Get your Bibles, Periscope. This Bible time. This is Ask the Elders. This is the Sir Walter Jones show. And Sir Walter Jones believed in giving the facts. 
And so since I'm flying solo, I'm going to continue to give the facts. I don't have no one to joke with, but that's okay. I'll joke with myself. Luke 4 and 1 says, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. First of all, notice he said that Jesus was full of the Holy Ghost, which is unique to me because if Jesus had to be full of the Holy Ghost, why is it that we think that we don't? As a matter of fact, Christ didn't do anything on earth without the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's how he was able to know whatever the will of his father was through the Holy Spirit. Now, we say that when Christ was in the Garden of Gethsemane, that he became flesh. I beg to differ with you. He was flesh from the day he stepped foot on the earth. Jesus Christ was 100% man, and he was 100% God. The thing of it is, he was used by God through the leading of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, he said in John that if you believe in me, the works that I do shall you do, and greater works shall you do because I go to my Father. Yet, he says, the works that I do is not my own, but my Father is doing the works. So if you continue to read, Jesus is going into the fact that he is going to heaven to receive the Holy Ghost and give him back to us which empowers us to be able to do the exact same thing Jesus did. Do I need to walk on water? I can if it was important. You don't believe it? <laughs> Place a situation where I need to <laughs> walk on water and see don't it happen. But if, it won't, if it's not necessary for it to happen, it just won't happen. Some things we want to happen, but it's not necessary. Paul said it's not expedient for it to take place. So we find in Luke 4 and 1 that Jesus was full. He was full of the Holy Ghost, and he returned from Jordan. And then it says he was led by the Spirit. Now, for a note, and I'm going to give this to you for free. Whenever you see Spirit capitalized in the Bible, it's referring to the Holy Spirit. So he says not only was he full of the Holy Ghost, but then he was led by the Spirit. So in Luke 4 and 1, you see the term Holy Ghost and Spirit being used interchangeably. Not only that, look in Luke 11 and 13. He says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? Which tells me that if you want the Holy Spirit, the first thing you have to do is ask. Ask him for it. Don't assume he knows that you want it or need it but you have to ask him for it. So again, John 7 and 38 and 39. Jesus said, now this is very interesting to me. He said, he that believeth on me, as the scripture have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And I know we've been hearing that scripture for years. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. But verse 39 explains to us what was he talking about. Verse 39 says, but this spake he of the spirit. Notice the word spirit and notice it's capitalized. Which they that believe on him should receive for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So notice again, he interchanges the word spirit and Holy Ghost in the same passage of scripture, same reference. So Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost uh, is the same word. And then Ephesians 1 and 13, he says that when we got saved and when we believed, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Why is it the Holy Spirit of promise? Because he promised it to us. And Jesus, when he died and rose again and ascended on high, the Bible lets us know that he received the promise of the Father and he sent it on earth to be and to dwell among us. Question number two, do I call the Holy Ghost an it or is there a gender that I should use when addressing the Holy Ghost? Is he a it or is he a he? 
Do I call him a him? For years, I've heard them say or address the Holy Ghost as it, meaning really just a force, some type of feel good or something that calls some some type of spiritual influence. But I want to let you know that he is more than just a influence. He is a he. Look at John 16, 13. John, the 16th chapter. Get your Bibles and turn with me, as my Baptist brother would say. John, the 16th chapter, verse 13. It says, how be it when he, when he, the spirit of truth, notice the word spirit, is capitalized again. When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he, he again, will guide you into all truth. I think Sister Abronia Scott said that the Holy Ghost is the spirit of truth. Yes. He will guide us into all truth. Yes. He is a guider. Yes. He is a teacher. And the Holy Ghost is just as concerned about your life as you are concerned about your life. Did you all know that? Yes. He's more concerned about you than you are concerned about you. So he says, how be it when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, which is very interesting to me because the Holy Ghost does not speak of himself. I'm getting tired of holding this mic, Walter. The Holy Ghost does not speak of himself. He speaks about Jesus. Jesus didn't speak about himself. He spoke about his father. And for those who believe that the Holy Ghost and uh, Jesus or God and the Holy Ghost is one They are. But if you think that Jesus is God, no, Jesus is the son of God. If you go back to when Jesus was baptized, uh, what took place in the baptism of Jesus, the Bible said that when he and John came up out the water, a voice from heaven opened up and said that this is my beloved son. Yet a bird or a dove, the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost in the form of a dove was resting on the shoulders of Jesus. So right off the bat, we have God in heaven speaking to his son Jesus on earth while the Holy Ghost in the form of a dove was resting upon his shoulder. That's three distinct persons or personalities or characters. That is God the Father, that's God the Son, and that's God the Holy Ghost or God the Holy Spirit. So back to John 16 and 13, he said, how be it when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, whatever he hears, whatever he hears, that shall he speak and he will show you things to come. Every believer that has the Holy Ghost dwelling in them and that are being led by the Holy Spirit should not be shocked in what takes place in life because the Holy Ghost, the Bible lets us know, will show you things to come. Problem is, many of us are looking for a prophetic word. I got a glare in my eye, but that's okay. Many of us are looking for a prophetic word, but if you recognize one of the things that the Holy Ghost does, he shows you things to come. In other words, he can give you the spirit of prophecy. No, you're not called a prophet, but he will give you and can give you the spirit of prophecy or the manifestation of prophecy. In 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, it talks about the manifestation of prophecy, which means if you are a yielding vessel and you're in church, let's use church service, and the spirit of prophecy needs to be spoken The Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost will use you as a willing vessel to cause you to open up your mouth and to prophesy whatever it is that God wants the people of God to know. And when the service is over, you can guarantee you are not a prophet, yet you spoke or you prophesy because he will show you things to come. He manifests himself in the spirit of prophecy. So is the Holy Ghost a he, he, he or it? He is a he. He is not an it. Now, 
there's something very interesting that I'm getting ready to talk about. Is the Holy Ghost a person? Periscope, I'll talk to y'all later. My battery's about to die. <laughs> Is the Holy Ghost, <laughs> y'all bear with me. What was my question? Does the Holy Ghost, is he a person? Facebook, is he a person? Hey, my sister Pamela Kidd, I graduated with her, went to eighth grade. Periscope uh, and Facebook, is the Holy Ghost a person? Is he a person? Yes or no? Is the Holy Ghost a person? Is he a person? Does the Holy Ghost have feelings? Does he have emotions? Does he love? Does he have expressions that people have? Now, I didn't say he was a body. Not a body. But I said he is a person. Very important. Is the Holy Ghost a person? Does he have a will like we do? Does he have knowledge? Can he express himself? Does the Holy Ghost have feelings? Does he have emotions? Can he even love? If he got all of those uh, attributes, then he can't just be a force or a, an influence. He has to be a person because a person is an individual that has feelings, that has knowledge, and that has an emotion. Those are the distinct characters or characteristics or marks of personality. Someone or something or something that has knowledge, feeling, or emotions, and they have a will. Any entity that thinks, feels, and wills. I'll say that again. Any entity that thinks, sees, or feels and wills is a person. One more time. Any entity that thinks, feels, and wills is a person. All right? Not a human body, but he is a person. So we sing the song, Holy, 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 God in three persons. All right? Does he have a will? Does he have a knowledge? Does he have feelings? Does he have emotions? Does the Holy Ghost love? Does the Holy Ghost even pray? Let's find out. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. Turn your iPads, your iPhones, uh, and your Bibles, the little thin ones, to 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. Second chapter, verses 10. 1 Corinthians 2 and 10 <laughs> says... But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. The spirit searches. Now, this is not the King James Version. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God. Except the Spirit of God. Nobody knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Nobody knows the thoughts of God but the Spirit of God. So I need to put a pin here. The Holy Ghost is also called the Spirit of God. He is also called the Spirit of Christ. So the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of God. And he is the spirit of Christ. So 1 Corinthians 2 and 10 says, But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Uh, for who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Here, knowledge is attributed to the Holy Spirit. We're clearly taught that the Holy Spirit is not merely an influence that illuminates our minds to comprehend the truth, but a being who himself knows the truth. So the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost has knowledge. He has knowledge. An influence or a force does not have knowledge. Yet the Holy Ghost 
has knowledge. He has enough knowledge to reveal some things to us. What I love about the Holy Ghost is you can pray and ask God for something. And really, to be honest with you, the Holy Spirit will give you the answer before you holler amen. Problem is, we don't know that he has given us the answer. So what we do is we get up from our knees. If, if Do saints still kneel down and pray? Uh, anyhow, when we get up from our knees, <laughs> knees, then we leave and not getting a full answer from God. But it is the Holy Spirit and it is one of his jobs that he gives us an answer. So when we pray and ask God for something, right off the bat, the Holy Spirit comes back and gives us the answer. God says no. <laughs> or God says yes. Whatever it is, we should never leave without an answer. But we should understand that the Holy Ghost gives us the answer. Now, I'm going to do something. I think that's 1 Corinthians 2. I'm going to check something else out. It's something else that's important to me. Uh that I want to look at. Yes, I got my pages, my Bible. I love my Bible. I have my iPad and all that. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, with my ashy hands. It's a beautiful thing. But what I still love is I still love the turning of the pages. That's 1 Corinthians 2 and uh, 10. Hmm. Yes, that ninth verse is funny to me. It says, but as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard. Neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Now, I've noticed a lot of times when we, we read that scripture, the Bible says eyes have not seen and ears have not heard and they have not entered to the hearts of men the good things that God has prepared for them that love him. We get excited and we begin to jump and rejoice and dance and all of that. But he just said, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man. You don't even know. So what it is that you're rejoicing about, you really don't know. But the very next verse, verse 10 says, but God hath revealed it unto us by his spirit, by the Holy Spirit. Remember when you see the word spirit capitalized, it is referring to the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit reveals to us the good things that God has prepared for those who love him. It also says that the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. The Holy Spirit searches. He literally searches the deep things of God. He's more than just a tongue. He's more than just speaking in tongue. He's more than just a good feeling. He literally and actually searches the deep things of God, and then he reveals it to those who love God. Wow. I don't know about you all, but I'm thankful to the Lord that he has given us his Holy Spirit. We're going to take a break at this time. I believe we're going to go to the Tommies. I'm not sure that may have been in the 80s. Boy, I showed Mr. 80s, and I showed Mr. Thomas, and they were singing a song. The song was about the Holy Ghost. I think that's my friend, Sister Leanne Fane. That girl was singing that song. Take a listen to this. And tell me, what was you doing when this song came out?
This is John Hanna, and you're listening to the Sir Walter Jones Show. <laughs> the Word of God is powerful, often misunderstood, but with proper study, you can gain accurate application of this potent source of life here on the Sir Walter Jones Show. Will you all say, yeah. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. Speak to me. Speak to me. Speak to me, Lord. Speak to me. Hello, everybody. This is the Sir Walter Jones Show. Uh, I'm subbing for my brother, the Sir Walter Jones himself, my flesh and blood. Uh, he is what we call the middle child. It's either him or my brother, Elder Dwayne Jones. Till this day, we don't know which one of them is the middle child. So there's still a struggle as far as which one of them is the middle child. Is it Walter or is it Dwayne? But Sir Walter is not here at the moment, and he asked me to fly solo. Uh, how am I doing? Can I get some hearts? I don't know what to give on Facebook Live. Hearts, thumbs up, some good expressions. Uh, tell him, call him. Tell him I'm doing a good job, all right? Tell him that you all don't miss him at all. And tell him, take your time coming back, and maybe just stay where you are for about a month, Okay. But don't tell him that I said that he was getting himself some milk and cookies. Okay? All right. Now, let's get back to it. We were in 1 Corinthians, right, the second chapter, and we were dealing with the fact that God reveals unto us his will by the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that searches the heart of God. He searches the mind of God because as humans, we don't know God's mind. We don't know God's will. We don't know God's design. We really don't know nothing about God except the Holy Spirit shows us and witnesses to us who God is. Uh, you don't even know the plan that God has in your life. I don't know if my volume is down, but you don't even know the plan that God has in your life except the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. Not only that, but it is the Holy Spirit that convicts man. He convicts us. He lets us know that you are in need of salvation. So Jesus said, when he come, he will convict the world of sin. He is the one. Man can't convict uh, the world. As a matter of fact, preachers can't convict the world. Preachers, it is our job as men and women of God to preach the gospel under the leadership of the Holy Ghost and allow the Holy Ghost to convict the hearts of the people. Because the Holy Ghost knows what each individual needs. So he will convict one, he will convince the other, but he will comfort the other one at the exact same time. And all we have to do is stand flat foot, speak what the Holy Ghost tells us to speak, and then allow the Holy Ghost to work. Because it is he that does the work. Sometimes we become flesh and then we give the people what it is that we want to give them and we're not successful. I've been there when whatever I'm saying at the time is effective and it's reaching the people. But because I have a printed text, I feel that I've been studying all night and I need to go ahead and give the people the printed text. So I feel like that all of my study was not in vain. But no, if the Holy Ghost is speaking through you and to you, then that's what you use and that's where you stay. My Baptist brother said, stay there. Stay right there. No, I can't sing. Stay right there. All right. So we're going to go back into 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. So when you ask God, remember this. When you ask in God through prayer, it is the Holy Ghost that gives you the answer right then. The Holy Ghost. Because remember something, the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of God that dwells within us. The Bible lets us know that, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Is that my brother and my friend? Yes, sir, my brother and friend, Elder Kevin McGee. I need you here. Sir Walter, preach, sir. That's my brother. Y'all, Sir Walter is on the wall. Somebody give a shout out to Sir Walter. Him downstairs getting some milk and cookies. All right, 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. Now, let's look at something. Uh, we've already dealt with the fact that the Holy Spirit has a will. He has a will. He searches all things, even the deep things of God. 
for among men who uh, who know the thoughts of a man except the man. Right. Then he says uh, in the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. So the spirit of God or the Holy Ghost, he knows the thoughts of God. He know what God is thinking. And it's unique to me because he will go from the presence of God very quick and come within us. And I'm paraphrasing because we know he's not leaving us, but he'll go from the presence of God, knowing the deep things of God and then reveal them to us. So in other words, God, do I need this or God? Can I have this or God? Will you bless me with this? You asking God, the Holy Ghost was given the answer by God and came here and gave you the answer. Sometimes God says yes, and sometimes God says no. <laughs> All right. Now, so he, we know that he has a will. Let's go to Romans, the eighth chapter. Romans 8. Romans 8. Romans 8 and 27. Dr. McGee, get your Bible. Get your Bible. Sir Walter, go get your Bible. Romans 8 chapter. Romans 8 and 27 says, And he who searches our hearts. This is not the King James Version. This is not the Bible that Paul used to read. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Now, the Spirit. In this passage, the word mind is referring to the Holy Spirit. So not only does the Spirit have a will, but now we see that he has a mind. Remember, any entity that has a will, that has a knowledge, or that has knowledge, or, or that has emotions, is called a person. For those of you that are just checking in, we're trying to see uh, does the Holy Spirit or does the Holy Ghost, is he a person or is he just a force? Does he have a mind? Does he have a will? Does he have an expression? Uh, I use the term God is still a gentleman. He still opens doors. Mm. Let's see. I see a conversation. Yes. Yes, Dr. McGee, you're supposed to be here. Uh, I'm going to start that rumor. You're supposed to be here helping your brother out. We're in the same jurisdiction, Doc. Come on, man. Come on. Hurry up. So Romans 8, 27 says, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. The spirit, he who searches our hearts, it's God that searches the heart. Remember in the book of Jeremiah, I believe it was, he says, your heart is desperately evil and wicked. Who can know it? And then God says he searches the vein. He searches the, the heart. To give to every man according to his doings. So it's God that's doing the searching of the heart. But Romans 8 and 27 says he, meaning God, who searches the heart, knows the mind of the spirit. Here, the spirit has a mind. Wow. How can an influence have a mind? So if the spirit has a mind, then he must be a person. I'm getting, somewhere. I'm getting somewhere. Help me say, hurry up and get there. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints. Now, the spirit is interceding for us. Now, another word for interceding, meaning the spirit is praying. Wait a minute. They never told me that the Holy Ghost prays for me. Isn't that something? That while I'm praying, the Holy Ghost is praying for me at the same time. He's praying to God. Yes, he does, Dr. McGee. The Holy Ghost is praying to God for me. Now, this blows my mind. He's making intercessions for me. Now, remember, Jesus never asked God for something that God did not give him. Because Jesus would never ask God for anything that's not according to his will. The Bible says in 1 John, if we ask God for anything according to his will, he hears us. He hears us if we ask him anything according to his will. So my question is this, is healing the will of God? 
If healing is the will of God, did Christ die for our sickness, our sins? Did he die for us to be healed? The Bible said, with his stripes we are healed. If he died for us to be healed, or if he was striped or stripped or beaten so that we can be healed, that means healing is the will of God. So he says in 1 John, if we ask anything according to his will, then he hears us. Mm. Here, the Holy Spirit is making intercessions for the saints in accordance with the will of God, which means he's asking God for something that it's God's will and it's the Holy Spirit's will because the Holy Spirit would not ask anything of God knowing that God was not his will for it to take place. Which also means this. You can ask God for something that's not according to his will. And I believe that the Holy Spirit will not ask God for that. Because the Holy Spirit will not ask God for something that's not according to the will of God. Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit will not ask God for anything that's not according to the will of God. Here in Romans 8 and 27 says, and he who searches our heart, he knows the mind. He know God knows the mind of the spirit. The spirit has a mind. And here's how they work in hand in hand. God is searching our hearts, right? While he's searching our hearts, the Holy Spirit is praying and making intercessions for us at the same time. And you have not a clue that all of this is taking place while you're asking God for something. My God, you're asking God for healing. While you're asking God for healing, the Bible said that God is searching your heart. And while he's searching your heart, the Holy Spirit is making intercession for you, asking God for something that's according to God's will. And healing is according to God's will. And then the Bible already told us that the Holy Spirit he reveals it to us. Remember, I have not heard. I'm sorry, your eyes don't hear. I have not seen, neither ear heard, the things that God has for us, right? But he says, but the Spirit is revealing to us by the Spirit. That's 1 Corinthians 12. So in this passage, the word mind is attributed to the Holy Spirit. And the Greek word translated mind is a comprehensive word, including the ideas of thought, feeling and purpose thought feeling and purpose all right now this one is going to blow my mind now we've been over the fact that the holy ghost has a mind right and we went over the fact that the holy ghost has a will right but did you know that the holy ghost has love I'm sorry, somebody asked the question, what love has to do with it? A whole lot. Did you not know that the Holy Ghost has love? Distinctively has love. Before I go to Romans, the 15th chapter, let me see what's going on on Facebook. And that word here denotes that he recognizes us because it's in his will. Yes, sir, it is in his will. A lot goes on behind the scene, Dr. McGee says. Yes, when we're praying, a whole lot of stuff is going on in the backdraft, as I call it, or the backdrop that we really don't know. It's, 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 it's amazing to know that heaven is moving uh, because one of his children is in trouble. Many times we think that God is not moving, God is asleep or something like that because you don't feel him. No, he's there. His word says, uh, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. Now deal with uh, that 28th verse in conjunction with the 27th verse. Mm, the 28th verse. The 28th verse of what? 28th verse of what? Oh, Romans 8. See, you're going to make me turn my pages. Romans, the 8th chapter. All right, I need some questions. Romans 8, 27. 27. 
Yes, Romans 8 and 27 says, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I think you said, what other verse? Did you say verse 28? Yes. And we know, you know what? I can't deal with that right now. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Dr. McGee, that's a separate show. I can't deal with that because I had one problem with the and we know in verse 8 of Romans, the 8th chapter in the 28th verse. Because there's a something that we're missing. All right. Uh uh, I'll tell it to you, and, 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 and here it is, verse 8 says, and, and we know, right? The problem is, we started this conversation off with and. And is a conjunction. Now, I know I went to all high school. I graduated in 1983, June. And it's okay. Uh, I could have went to Craigia or somewhere else, but uh, no, I... <laughs> I decided to go to Orr High School, y'all. I'm sorry. That was the school I went to. Mm. So the word, and we know. But there's something you've got to do. you got to go to the 22nd verse first. Uh, Romans 8 and 22 says, for we know. Okay? For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Then we got to go what's taking place between verse 22 all the way to 28. Verse 28 says, and we know. Natalie Johnson Bullock, hey, and we know. So we've got to deal with the and we know, but before, because there are a lot of things we say that all things work together for the good. Some of the things we're, we're referencing to has nothing to do with this particular verse in the Bible. Every word, hear this, every word in the Bible, <laughs> every word in the Bible is distinctively put there for a reason. For instance, when you look at Romans 8 and 28, it says, and we know. But you got to say, and we know, which means there's a continuation of the conversation. Then you have to jump to verse 22 says, for we know. So first, it's for we know what takes place all the way down. Then you get to the and we know. All right. <laughs> Dr. McGee, I need you to come on. Angela, help me out, Sister Garrett. He, he's messing with me. Help me out. I need you to get him straight. How do we know? The Spirit of God tells us. The Holy Spirit, he reveals it to us. All right. That's verse 27. Let's look at verse 26. Likewise, the spirit also helpeth. He helpeth. He helpeth our infirmity. And infirmity is a weakness. It is a frailty, right? So he helps our infirmities. He helps our weaknesses. Uh, uh, my mother is calling me on my cell phone. And normally I answer the call when my mama calls. But I, I can't do it right now. Sorry, mama. And for those of you that don't believe it, see it said mommy's. Mommy's calling. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, right? For we know not what we should pray for as we, as we ought. There are times when we, when we pray for things that we're praying for the wrong thing. So we don't know what we're praying for. There are some sicknesses. Let me go here for a minute. There are some sicknesses that people have. Let's say people are having uh, major back problems or major heart problems and they're praying for their heart or they're praying because they have a bad ulcer or something. Just just a reference. So we go to praying for that. But then the spirit reveals that the problem is not that. That's a result of it's a result of unforgiveness. So what happens is then we begin to pray for the spirit of forgiveness to take place in that person's life. Then when that person began or tend to forgive people, it starts manifesting in his body. Because forgiveness or the lack of uh, brings sickness, physical sickness to your body that will not show up on the x-ray. Yes, you can become physically sick because you refuse to forgive. So the Bible says forgive. I did a series on 
forgiveness. I think it was a six-week series on forgiveness. It even affected me, caused me to forgive some people that I really did not know I had not yet forgiven. It's very important that you forgive. A lot of times we don't want to forgive because we want the person to feel the hurt and the pain that we're in and we want them to suffer and we want them to see us. And there are times when we want justice done or harm or hurt done to them. Jesus says, for the sake of Christ and because Christ forgave you, forgive them and move on. I'll share the secret with you. When you forgive a person, you release the power of God to move upon them so that God can judge them or deal with him, them according to his will. But when you forgive the person, you also release the power of God to work in your life. Oh, come on, somebody. So let's get back to this. Does the Holy Ghost have love? Does he love? Mm. Oh. If we don't forgive, we cannot be forgiven. Mark 11. Yes. He says, if you don't forgive men, their trespasses, your heavenly father will not forgive you. I got a problem with that, y'all. You know what my problem is? Because if you go with your sins unforgiven, can you make it in? Can you make it in with your sins unforgiven? What do I mean? If you refuse to forgive men, God says he refused to forgive you. So you're walking on this earth unforgiven by God because you refuse to forgive. Mm. And the word forgive comes from a Greek word. You can Google it, 863 in your Strong's Concordance. It means to send away. To send away or to divorce or to dismiss the word uh, forgive means to literally send it away. Send that thing away. Now, it's got to be the Holy Spirit that's, that's, that's moving upon me to share this moment of forgiveness right now. Right in the middle of this, he, he uh, places in my spirit uh, uh, to talk about forgiveness at this point. It's very important, regardless of what takes place. Understand something, and I'll have to see if Sir Walter can have me back so we can deal with forgiveness. There's a lot of things we need to know about unforgiveness that's very, 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 very important. You'll find that, number one, your sins can't be forgiven because you refuse to forgive. You'll also find that there are certain physical sickness that takes place on your life because you refuse to forgive. And you'll find a whole lot of things that takes place because you refuse to forgive. Just go ahead and forgive and go on about your life. Now, uh, for God so loved the world, the Bible said that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish. The whole plight of Christ on the cross was so that our sins can be forgiven. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And to be honest with you, many people who do things against you, they really don't know what they're actually doing. They don't know the seriousness of what they are doing. Uh, yes, yes, please type in there, bring Rodney back for this particular episode, Sir Walter, and tell him to miss his plane <laughs> for, for a week. All right, here it is, Romans. <coughs> Romans 15 and 30. I need an usher to bring me some water and a napkin, please. Romans 15. <laughs> Sorry. Romans 15 and 30. Any ushers out there? Can y'all type me some water? Romans 15 and 30. I urge you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit. Notice the word love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Romans 15 and 30. Let me read that again. Let me read it from the kingdom, James, as we call it. Somebody said that this is the Bible that Paul was reading, which is very unique. Romans 15 and 30. Let me read it in King James for you, King James diehards. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, 
and for the love of the Spirit that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Notice that the Spirit has love. Thank you, my brother. No problem. Yes, sir. You're all right with me. This guy is something else. He's the sound man. He's the water man. And the napkin. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm ready now. All right. So, so the spirit has love. Paul says, I urge you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love, by the love, by the love of the spirit. Wait a minute. Nobody ever told me that the spirit had love. They told me that God has love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And he loved us so till he gave us Jesus. The Bible said, while we were yet without, while we were yet in our sins, Christ died for us. And then Jesus loved us so much until he gave himself. And now we know that God has love and we know that Jesus has love. But did you know that the Holy Spirit has love? When we come back, we're going to look at another attribute of the Holy Spirit. This is Brother Rodney Jones standing in for my brother, the Elder Walter Jones, and this is the Sir Walter Jones Show. Be right back. a day. UBM Praise Chicago, a service of the UBM Networks. Woo, you sure gotta climb a lot of steps to get to this Capitol building here in Washington. Well, I wonder who that sad little scrap of paper is. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. Well, it's a long, long journey to the Capitol City. It's a long, long wait while I'm sitting in committee. But I know I'll be a law someday. At least I hope and pray that I will. But today I am still just a bill. Gee, Bill, you certainly have a lot of patience and courage. Well, I got this far. When I started, I wasn't even a bill. I was just an idea. Some folks back home decided they wanted a law passed, so they called their local congressman, and he said, you're right, there ought to be a law. Then he sat down and wrote me out and introduced me to Congress, and I became a bill. And I'll remain a bill until they decide to make me a law. I'm just a bill, yes I'm only a bill, and I got as far as Capitol Hill. Well now I'm stuck in committee and I'll sit here and wait, while a few key congressmen discuss and debate whether they should let me be alone. Oh, I hope and pray that they will, but today I am still just a bill. Listen to those congressmen arguing. Is all that discussion and debate about you? Yeah, I'm one of the lucky ones. Most bills never even get this far. I hope they decide to report on me favorably, otherwise I may die. Die? Yeah, die in committee. Oh, but it looks like I'm going to live. Now I go to the House of Representatives and they vote on me. If they vote yes, what happens? Then I go to the Senate and the whole thing starts all over again. Oh, no. Oh, yes. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And if they vote for me on Capitol Hill, well, then I'm off to the White House where I'll wait in a line with a lot of other bills. 
for the president to sign. And if he signs me, then I'll be along. How I hope and pray that he will. But today I am still just a bill. You mean even if the whole Congress says you should be a law, the president can still say no? Yes, that's called a veto. If the president vetoes me, I have to go back to Congress and they vote on me again, and by that time you're so By that time, it's very unlikely that you become a law. It's not easy to become a law, is it? No, but how I hope and pray that I will, but today I am still just a bill. He signed your bill, now you're a law. Oh, yes! The following show is paid programming and does not necessarily express the views and opinions of Urban Broadcast Media and its subsidiaries. Thank you for listening to UBM Praise. The Word of God is powerful, often misunderstood, but with proper study, you can gain accurate application of this potent source of life here on the Sir Walter Jones Show. If I were you, I would say, yeah. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. Speak to me. Speak to me. I remember when that song came out. I love that song. And that song really ministered to my heart. Speak to me. That's the, the late Andre Crouch. That man knew how to write some songs. Uh, I, I, we have to appreciate it. And, and while we're dealing with songs, I don't know. I kind of like have a problem with the songs that we sing today. All of our songs, for you singers, all of our songs is supposed to be scriptural based. Scriptural based. Because what happens is people go by the song and not by the scripture. So your song needs to be scriptural based. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is your brother Rodney Jones of the Sir Walter Jones. Sir Walter Jones is not here at the time. You all know where he is. Him down stairs to get him some milk and cookies and guess what facebook my ipad has now 10 percent left uh, somebody gonna have to bring me a charger hurry up i got 10 percent. so if it goes out y'all know what happened so let me get to uh natalie johnson bullock's question what does it mean to quench to quench the spirit what does it mean to quench now if you had a fire right you take water and you take the water and you throw it on the fire. What you just did was you quenched the spirit. How can you quench the spirit? The spirit is moving in our lives. For instance, our worship services. Sometimes it breaks my heart to see what takes place in our worship service. A lot of times we're not in a worship service. A lot of times we're in a man service because everything is centered around man. It's centered around the leader. And I use the term leader very carefully because I only really know two leaders. Moses, because a leader is one who leads you to a place where he has been. Moses led Israel to and through the wilderness. Moses was in the wilderness for 40 years before he came and got the children of Israel. He was not lost. So he was a great leader. And then Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there ye may be also. He is another leader. Where is he leading us? He's leading us to heaven. My fellow preachers, it's our job to lead the people to Christ. Once we get them to Christ, he leads them to heaven. I'm just going to leave that one right there. I'm going to be like that frog and I'm just going to set my tea. So how does one, or what does it mean to quench the Holy Spirit? That's when the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is trying to move in any time, either any worship service or in a healing conference or even in your life. When the Holy Spirit instructs you and tells you what to do and you decide that you're going to do something different. I can guarantee you by the thumbs up, how many of you have been in a situation where something on your inside told you to apologize to that person? You may have done something wrong. You may have done something right, but something on your inside says to you to apologize to that person. That something is not just a something, but that something is actually the Holy Spirit bringing conviction in your life for you to do the right thing. So what he's doing is he's convicting you to apologize to that person. So what happens is when you refuse to do it, what you're doing is two things. You're grieving him by not being obedient to him. 
and you're quenching him by not allowing him to continue to move. You place yourself in a very dangerous situation when we're not subject to the move of the Holy Spirit. We just had a powerful worship setting at the New Nations Anointed Ministries Church of God in Christ, 1700 West 87th Street. The Dr. Prophetess Hattie B. Jones is the pastor and shepherd is there. Uh, the Lord moved in such a way till even the organist stopped playing. I stood back from the podium because the Bible says, Jesus says, occupy till I come. Once he's there, we need to step back and allow the Holy Spirit to work. If we step back and let him work, we won't have to have altar calls. We won't have to have altar lines and we won't have to call up lines because the Holy Spirit will heal that person right where they are. Because remember, the Spirit brings conviction. He brings healing. He brings a whole lot of things to the pot or to the plate. All right. So the problem is because of the format, because of the agenda and because of the program, what we tend to do is quench the spirit or we grieve him by not allowing him to continue his flow. He wants to heal us. The Holy Spirit wants to heal us. He comes into the room to bring healing. He comes into the room to bring conviction. He comes into the room to bring wisdom, to bring knowledge, to bring understanding, to bring forgiveness. He comes into the room to just set people free. That's what the Holy Ghost does. But what happens is because of time and because of the program of man, what we do is we quench him. We literally put fire on the move. I'm sorry. We literally put water on the fire of God or on the move of God. And we cause him not to move. And then he takes the back seat because he is a gentleman. He will not force himself. He is a gentleman. So that's how we quench him. And that's what it means to quench the Holy Spirit. And the Bible lets us know, do not grieve him. Because understand something else. He will only strive with us for a period of time. Any, I mean, we, we do marriage like that. We're only going to be with our spouse who just acts like we don't exist <laughs> for such a period of time. After that period of time, I'm out of here. Gonzola, exit, stage left. Gone. Heaven's the murgatory. I'm out of here. So... If you can do that, if you don't want to be in the same room where you're unwanted, where there's no love for you, and you can feel it, what do you think goes on in our worship services? I beg the people of God to allow the Holy Spirit to work. Preachers, I know you want to preach your sermon, but there comes a time when your sermon may have to be placed on hold and let the people of God be healed, delivered, and set free. Why do we wait until the end of the service before we make an altar call if one is needed? Why not make one at the beginning? Because someone is hurting while we're trying to lay out the three Hebrew boys. Somebody, soul and spirit is afflicted. But when the spirit of God comes in, let him move. Let him have his free course. Let him have his way. Somebody type amen for me. Let him have his way. I need 13 people to type amen and go touch 20 people. That's another thing I'm tired of. So the spirit has love. He has love. Now, we've already dealt with the fact that the spirit or the Holy Ghost is a person. He is not just an influence, which means he should be prayed to because he is God, the Holy Spirit. He is God, the Holy Ghost. He is the spirit of Christ and he is the spirit of God at the same time, he has a specific work that he does. Yes, he does. So that was Romans, the 15th chapter. All right. Now let's go to Ephesians 4. Ephesians, the fourth chapter. We dealt with that, but I need you to find the scripture. Ephesians, the fourth chapter. And I believe it is the 30th verse. Ephesians 4. 
and 30. By the way, Ephesians is one of my number one books. I love it. I really love it. Ephesians 4 and 30. First of all, let's look at verse 29. It says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Let no corrupt communication. In other words, your conversation should not be demeaning. It should not be evil. But that which is good to the use of edifying, whatever you say should be building people up and not tearing them down. That it may minister grace unto the hearers. Okay? Verse 30 says, And grieve not, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Grieve not the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit of God. Grieve not, which means he can be grieved. He has an emotion or he has a feeling. Now, he's not emotional like us, but he has an emotion, which means he can be grieved. He has love and he expresses his love. You find his love in what? Um, is in there somewhere. Yes, uh, uh, Romans 15 and 30. So we know about the love of the Father, and we know about the love of Jesus, but now we know about the love of the Spirit. You say, I blew a fuse? Did it, did it, did it touch the radio as the <laughs> point of contact? Natalie, I'm going to touch in the green. Uh, I need 13 people to touch your radio, and we're going to talk about that one day. I'm tired of touching my neighbor. I don't go to church and touch neighbors. My neighbor lived next door to me. When I went to church, I left him next door to me. I'll touch him when I get home, shake his hand and speak to him. I don't go to church to touch neighbors. I go to church to raise my hand unto the Lord and praise God. Lift up your hands. Lift up your hands. All right. That's what we're supposed to do. All right. So now let's go back to Romans 8 and 26. In the same way, the spirit helps us in our weaknesses, right? Or our infirmities. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings that words cannot express, which means the Holy Spirit literally and actually prays for us. You ever told somebody, pray for me? And they say, I will, baby, I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> and they leave and forget all about you. Mm. But the Holy Spirit. He prays not only with you, but he prays for you. And he intercedes to God for you and through you. And whatever the Holy Spirit says, it reaches God. And then God gives the Holy Spirit an answer and a solution to your situation. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we yet without sin, which tells me Christ was po uh, tempted in all points. Notice it said all points. Sin has three main points. My hands is ashy. Sin has three main points, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Every sin that we commit falls in one of those categories, and Christ was tempted in all of those, yet the Bible said without sin. The Holy Ghost can empower you to overcome sin. Oh, I'm sorry. This is not my pulpit. The Holy Ghost can empower you not to commit sin. What we have to do is subject ourselves to the move of the Holy Spirit. You know he's moving because he brings conviction. When you do something wrong and you feel bad, you feel sad, you feel hurt, you feel afflicted on the inside, that's the Holy Spirit bringing conviction. What you need to do is resolve that matter. So if you've done someone wrong and the Holy Ghost convicts you, go back to that person and make it right. Because the Holy Ghost does not want you to do wrong while he dwells in your body. I'll say that again. The Holy Ghost does not want you to do wrong while he dwells in your body. All right. So he prays for us. All right. Let me move on. Ah, Revelation 2. Revelation, Revelation, the second chapter says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the church. Now, wait a minute. That means the spirit is talking. 
I did not know that. The Spirit literally has something to say to me. So we've gone over the fact that the Spirit or the Holy Spirit is not just a, uh, an influence, but the Holy Spirit is a person. He is God manifested in the Spirit of God. So he has a will. He has knowledge. He has love. And now we see that he can be grieved, which means he has emotions, he has feelings, and he has a thought. He has knowledge, which means he is a person. So Romans, uh, Revelation 2 and 7 says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Revelation 2 and 7. Here the Spirit is set before us not merely as an interpersonal enlightenment that comes to our mind, but a person who speaks out the depths of the wisdom of God and whispers into our ear and tells us what God wants. Isn't that something? When we're in our worship service, we move by the leading of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who conducts the actual program. You remember looking at some of your programs that says program subject to change. That's a true statement, or at least it's supposed to be a true statement. He is. Uh, hey, my sister, Sister Cook. Uh, Elder McGee says, my book, yes, yes, Dr. McGee. He's an expert in the book of Revelation. Also, my brother, Elder Dwayne Jones, is excellent in the book of Revelation. Sir Walter is good and excellent in Revelation. And my brother, Minister Justin Jones, those guys is awesome. And I believe everyone have their main book of the Bible. And what we need to do is let's come together and let's speak for the common goal or for the common man. Let's do a work for God together. Somebody type amen. All right, so Revelation says, hear what the Spirit says. So it's the Spirit that's speaking. So now you're telling me that the Holy Ghost actually speaks to us. He actually tells us what to do. The Holy Spirit, he instructs us. And I say this, if you want a godly principle, if you want a godly result, you must give a godly principle. If you want something done with an answer that God gives his blessings on, you have to subject yourself to the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit actually speaks to the church. Here's key. Every musician needs to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Every singer, every praise leader, every usher, please, need to be filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost. Because if the preacher is filled with the Holy Ghost, if the musician is filled with the Holy Ghost, if the praise conductor is filled with the Holy Ghost, and if the usher, if the team is filled with the Holy Ghost, when the Holy Ghost moves and speaks, everyone would be with one accord. Yes. No, I haven't talked about that yet. If we all allow the Holy Spirit to speak, we all would be with one accord. Matter of fact, the Holy Spirit will tell the organist what song to play and what key to play it in. Then he will speak to a singer what song to sing that will move the people of God. And then the Spirit of God can come in and usher in in his fullness and bring glory and bring the spirit of praise and, and bring healing and all kind of things. Just because Revelation 2 and 7 what the Spirit says to the church. Sister Brony Scott says, did you already talk about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament? Ah, uh, no. Matter of fact, maybe I should go ahead and talk about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Let me ask you a question, Facebook. Um, did the Holy Spirit just start working in the New Testament, or is the Holy Ghost an Old Testament reference as well? Is the Holy Ghost just a New Testament terminology, New Testament presence, or is the Holy Ghost working in the Old Testament? Someone say old or new or both. Just type in old, new, or both. Which one is it? 
does the Holy Ghost or did he work in the beginning of times or is he just in the New Testament only? Because a lot of times we think that he just worked, you know, in the New Testament. So uh, 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 Andrew says both. Dr. McGee says, nope, all through the Bible. So he says both. Natalie Johnson says both. Abronius Scott says both. So we agree. Eve Cook says no. Old Testament book of Genesis, both books. You go, my sister. Carrie Jones, hey, cuz. You got to be my family because you're Jones. Says both. Yes. The Holy Ghost, since day one, has always been, been. Sorry, I went to old high school. Angela Garrett, that's it, my sister. Yes, he worked in both. I'm going to need an usher to come and wipe my sweat. I need a big towel, real big towel. So the Bible talks about in the beginning. Let's go to Genesis, the first chapter. You'll find the first reference of the Spirit of God. Get your Bibles. Get your Bibles. Hurry up. Get your Bibles. Go with me. In uh, Natalie Bullock says, Genesis 1 and 26. Ah, very good, my sister. Uh, Genesis, the first chapter, and the first verse. Verse 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's my Alvin Carter voice. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Here it is in verse 2. And the Spirit, capital S, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. So we find the first thing that takes place before God does anything He sends his spirit or he sends the Holy Ghost. Yes, he moves upon the face of the water. Understand something. Even when we got saved, what took place in our life is God sent the presence of his Holy Spirit into our life to bring life. Then he spoke light and everything else. Hmm. What happened between Genesis 1 (laughs) and Genesis, the first chapter, verse 2? Y'all, Elder McGee wants to get me in trouble We call it the thousand year gap between verse one and verse two. It is said that there is a thousand years because it says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse two says, and the earth was without form. Help me out, Sister Cook. I believe the word was in the Hebrew means became. So if you look at it this way, it says, and the earth became without form and void. What took place on the earth between the first verse and the second verse, which we believe is where the fall of Lucifer came. So by the time we get to chapter or verse two, Lucifer is now on the earth. Uh, what's Abrona says, I'm on the road. Thank God for Facebook Live. You go, my sister. Hurry up and get here. You got a few more minutes. Hurry up. So he says in verse two, and the earth was without form and void or and the earth became without void and form. Uh, And darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. First thing that takes place is God's spirit. His spirit moves upon the face of the water. First thing that takes place in a believer's life is the Holy Ghost moves upon that individual. I feel the need to tell you this also. The Holy Ghost has been following us since day one. To bring conviction into our lives. When you was in that tavern. When you was in wherever you was. The Holy Ghost was following you there. To convict you to come out of your sin. So the Holy Ghost brings conviction. The Holy Ghost tells you. That you are in need of a saving. The Holy Ghost tells you that you are a sinner. And that you need to be saved. Then the Holy Ghost tells you. Who it is that can save you, which is Jesus, my Facebook, just died. My live Facebook just died out uh, because I have no more power. Well, Facebook, sorry, it's gone. I'll continue with uh, Spricker.com. So verse 2 says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved Upon the face of the waters. And God said let there be light. 
and there was light. And God saw that the light, that it was good. This is something unique that happened, that it blows my mind in verse 4. It says, and God divided the light from the darkness. Wait a minute. Darkness and light appears before God at the same time. He says, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So when God created the heaven and the earth, darkness and light was both standing in the presence of God. And God, the almighty, separated the two from one another. That's a powerful God. There's nobody who can do the things that God has done, is doing, and can do. We're getting ready to take a brief break. And when we come back, I hope you got some pen and paper to write with because I'm going to give you some things that the Holy Ghost does. I got a whole list of things that are going to tell you that the Holy Ghost does, and I have a lot of scripture. So I'm going to kind of move kind of fast on this. I need you to write it down. If you need me to email it to you, uh, call uh, Sir Walter Jones, and I'll go through him. All right, Facebook, uh, I'll be right back. This is the Sir Walter Jones Show. I'm subbing for him. This is his brother, the young Elder Rodney Lawrence Jones. See you in a few minutes. Let's hear you sing the alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, to cookie bust. <laughs> You're not singing the alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, Cookie Monster is in the letter of the alphabet. It goes Q, R, S, do you <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're just teasing me. W, X, Y, and Z. Now I, I know my, my ABCs. ABCs. Next time Cookie Monster. <laughs> Next time Cookie Monster can do it with you. I'm leaving. Hi. Hey, do you want to play a game now? Okay, here. I help. One of these things is not like the other things. One of these things just doesn't belong. Can you guess which thing is not like the other thing? Before I finish my song. Now look closely. Look. Now something here. One of these things does not belong. I'll give you a hint. It has to do with how many cookies are on each plate. Okay? You ready? No? Okay, keep looking. I look too. It's hard even for a monster. Keep looking. Oh, did you guess? Oh, yeah? Did you guess which thing is not like the other things? Did you guess with all your might? If you guessed that this thing is not like the other things, you know what? You know what? You're right. Oh, you're absolutely right. God is powerful, often misunderstood, but with proper study, you can gain accurate application of this potent source of life here on the Sir Walter Jones Show. Speak, Lord. Speak to me. Hello, Facebook and uh, hello, Spricker.com. Yes, sir. Uh, we are back on the air trying to make this thing go live, uh, having some little difficulties making my Facebook go back live right in the middle of the conversation. Uh, we lost my battery on my battery product, but that's okay. We're still on Spricker.com. 
and we're still going to make the rest of this happen. I'm standing in for my brother, Sir Walter Jones, very intelligent, wise, and smart brother. Uh, that's my boy. He's somewhere out over in another country, another state, <laughs> somewhere. Uh, we're praying his uh, making it back to here safe without any hurt, harm, or danger. As the old folks said, pray my traveling grace. All righty. The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is what we're talking about on today. The Holy Ghost. Very unique uh, subject matter. And there are many, 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 many questions that needs to be dealt with uh, in dealing with the Holy Ghost. For some reason, it's still not working. Uh, there are many, many things that uh, we have, many questions. Is the Holy Ghost a separate, does he have a separate work in the Godhead than Jesus and then God? And the answer is yes. Before we went to our break, we did do uh, one Genesis reference to the Holy Ghost where uh, when God got ready to recreate the earth, the Bible says, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and then God said, let there be light. Throughout the scripture, we see where the Godhead is always working. They're working as one, and they're working because they are one. It is not three gods, but it is one God eternally existing in three persons. So I asked a question one time. Should we praise the Holy Ghost? Should we pray to the Holy Ghost? And someone said no. And my question is, why then do we sing the song, the doxology song? Well, we sing praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Why do we sing that song if he is someone that we should not be singing to or praising. And so I'm thankful to God that we are back live on Facebook as well. Facebook, hello, welcome back. We're back live again on the last hour in the last segment of this topic very much needed on the Holy Ghost. Now, I'll tell you this, that there is a difference in just being filled with the Holy Ghost and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. There are two operations. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is to empower us for service. It is not to empower you to speak in tongue. The baptism of the Holy Ghost, the purpose of it, if you read it, let's go to Acts, the first chapter. Acts, the first chapter, I think it is. Acts, the first chapter. You're welcome, my sister Angela. Hey, sister Abronia. Acts, the first chapter, because for some reason we think that the Holy Ghost is just a tongue. No, he's more than a tongue. But something interesting that Jesus says to the brethren uh, after he told them to tarry until you be endued with power. All right. Uh, Acts 1 and... Right? Acts 1 and 8. Is that what I want to go to? Oh, there it is. Okay. But ye shall receive power. Right? After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea. And in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Uh, Sister Brona says, thank you. People think that the baptism of the Holy Ghost was speaking in tongues. Please teach the people. No, uh, baptism of the Holy Ghost is not speaking in tongues. But people do receive a tongue or a language uh, <clears throat> when one is baptized in the Holy Ghost. They will possibly receive it uh, and it's all, I don't lost y'all. It, it, 
It's all on the move of God. Time will not allow me, but I can show you some things that took place in the lives of the people that they spoke. Those that spoke in tongues, uh, what really took place and what was it that they were speaking? Because each time, if you notice that they were speaking, they were praising God. But they were praising God in another language. So the Holy Ghost or the baptism of the Holy Ghost is not speaking in tongue. There are a lot of people who speak in tongue out loud at churches. And I'm, uh, I'm afraid to tell you that anyhow, um, wrong, uh, Acts 1 and 8 says, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria. Look at the word witnesses. If you research the word witness, it is the word martyr. In other words, he says you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and you will become martyrs. You will be killed. But what he is saying is. The purpose of the baptism of the Holy Ghost is so that you can be effective in your working or effective ministry. It is for the purpose of effectiveness in your witnessing about Christ. That's what he is all about. The baptism. That's the purpose of the baptism. I grew up hearing people telling me, well, honey, you can't do this because you don't have the Holy Ghost. I had the Holy Ghost because I was saved, but I was not baptized in the Holy Ghost. There's a difference in being baptized in the Holy Ghost and just having the Holy Ghost, as we call it. And I really don't like to use the term having the Holy Ghost. Uh, I prefer the term being filled with the Holy Ghost or the precious gift of the Holy Ghost, of which... The baptism of the Holy Ghost is another degree. I'll put it to you like this. When a person is born or born again, the Holy Ghost resides in them as a residence. But when a person is baptized in the Holy Ghost, now the Holy Ghost goes from resident to president. You are now the sole owner. The Holy Ghost is now the sole owner of your body. And Jesus, or the Bible says you are not your own. For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify the Lord in your body. Then he says, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Yes, the Holy Ghost is a term that is used basically after and uh, in the book of Acts, the second chapter, where we, we know it as Pentecost. And that's why we are called a Pentecostal church, because we believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We are a holiness Pentecostal church because we believe in and we support the baptism of the Holy Ghost with speaking in tongues. We do believe in the speaking in tongues. I do not discourage the speaking in tongues, but I'll leave that to another show. So the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Ghost is for effective ministry, effective witnessing. The Holy Ghost brings effectiveness in anything that we do. The Bible talks about uh, that Jesus was anointed with the Holy Ghost and he went about doing good because God was with him. He was anointed, which tells me that any and everything Christ did on earth, we can do it because he was governed, he was ruled, he was led by, and he was full of and he was used by the Holy Ghost. He didn't do anything outside of the move of the Holy Ghost. And it's unique to me because if Christ could do that, why are we greater than him and we don't need the Holy Ghost? I'll say that again. If Christ did not do anything on earth without the leading of the Holy Ghost, why is it that we feel that we don't have to have the Holy Ghost? I grew up and they taught us about the Holy Ghost. And we had a love for it, a yearning for him, a desire for him. And we wanted to be filled with him so much till we were even fasting for it. And I'll be honest with you, you don't have to fast for the Holy Ghost. 
because the Holy Ghost is a gift. The Bible said that God gives it to them that believe or receive him by faith. You don't have to fast for a gift, yet you can fast for him. It is your own prerogative, but you don't have to. It is not necessary. Yet, if you choose to fast for him, you can. But the Holy Ghost is a gift. Yes, he wants to give it to you. Remember, we read how much more your heavenly father wants to give the Holy Ghost to them that ask. If you being uh, good fathers know how to give or you being fathers know how to give your children good gifts. How much more does God want to give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? Yes, the Holy Ghost is always needed, especially when it comes to witnessing. Yes, ma'am. Because I'm going to be honest with you. None of us know Jesus. None of us have ever seen Jesus. And if Jesus was to walk in front of us, we would not be able to determine him from Adam. Because we've never seen him. So one of the operations or the purposes or the jobs or the manifestations of Jesus is to be a witness of who Jesus is in our life. What the Holy Ghost does is he shows us who Christ is. Now, have you ever been there when a preacher was preaching about something that he had no clue of? He was never there. He preached about the cross of Christ, but you felt something in your spirit, something that moved and brought conviction. That's the Holy Ghost. That's him being a witness. Now, the Bible talks about every word is established by two or three witnesses. The Bible is a witness and the Holy Ghost is a witness. He witnesses to us of who Jesus is. Now, I have a list. I have a list. These are my other notes. I, I have a list of things. I'll email it to you if you want it. But this is a list of things that I wrote down of who the Holy Ghost. My sister, Evangelist Beverly Rutledge, she is the state president of the Evangelist Department. Powerful woman of God. She conducted revivals and people got married in the revival because they got tired of shacking. That's what I'm talking about. Anyhow, hey, my sister, that's what I'm talking about. So let's look at something else on the Holy Ghost. Number one, write this down. Hurry up. I ain't got but a few minutes. The Holy Ghost is the Spirit of God. He is the Spirit of God, and he is the Spirit of Jesus, Romans 8 and 9. The Holy Ghost is the Spirit of God. Remember, Jesus says he is the life, the light. He is the life, and what else he is? He is truth, right? He says that I am the way. I am the truth. Well, the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of truth. Watch this. If Jesus is truth, and the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of truth, that means the Holy Ghost is the spirit of Jesus. Are you hearing me? So the Holy Ghost is who's operating in the New Testament church right now. He is leading. Now, make a note to yourself. The Holy Ghost never does anything outside of the cross. You got your popcorn, pen, and paper ready, Arnold? The Holy Ghost will never do anything outside of what Christ did on the cross. So if you need healing through the Holy Ghost, and while I'm on healing, let me say this. We don't have to really beg God for healing. What you have to do is accept it by faith because Christ already died. And the Holy Ghost is here to make sure it is accomplished in your life. So the Holy Ghost, whatever he does, he does it within the confines of the blood of Jesus Christ. Whatever Jesus Christ died for on the cross, the Holy Ghost makes sure that we get it. Not only that, but Jesus said, I will send you another comforter. Hand movements. Another comforter. The term another means of the same substance, of the same quality, of the same material, and everything. So which means whatever Jesus did on earth in the flesh... Or as old folks say, in the flush, the Holy Ghost is doing the same thing, only we cannot see him with the natural eye. He is working his work within us. He brings conviction within us. He brings healing within us. He brings wisdom and knowledge within us. 
He reveals to us the deep things of God, the hidden truths of God. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit reveals it to us. Remember, we don't know what to pray for as we are. But the Holy Spirit or the Spirit makes intercessions for us, which means he prays for us and he prays with us and he intercedes for us and he intercedes through us. He asks God. God searches our heart. He tells the Spirit the answer and the Spirit comes back and gives us the answer. I'm starting this offering great off with 50 (laughs) cents. Yes, sir. Holy Ghost is the Spirit of God and Jesus, Romans 8 and 9. Number two, write it down. Hurry up, hurry up. The Holy Ghost guides us into all truth, Romans 8 and 11. If it's a situation of truth, the Holy Ghost guides us because Jesus is truth. Pilate asks, what is truth? Jesus is truth. He is the truth. He is uh, the way. Oh, no, I can't get service in the subway. Really? Get out the subway. Hurry up. Laverne, Sims, hurry up. I know the Sims family. Number three, the Holy Ghost is the spirit of truth, which is John 14 and 17. Jesus says he is truth, and the Holy Ghost is the spirit of truth. He brings us an understanding. He reveals who Christ is to us. The Holy Ghost is who helps us preach. He empowers us to preach. He empowers the musicians to play skillfully. Upon the instrument, he empowers the evangelist to effectively give the word of God in the streets and in the highways. He empowers the singer to sing the proper song because every song, you can't always break every chain in every song or in every service. I'm sorry. Some of those songs is, some of those Kirk Franklin songs is only for the radio. Have no business in the house of worship. Because the song you sing will help to usher in the presence of God or it will keep his presence out. One or the other. Yes. Uh, A, Jesus is truth, John 14 and 6. Okay. B, the gospel is the word of truth in Ephesians 1 and 13. Here's the thing. We preach the word of truth. Jesus is truth and the Holy Ghost is the spirit of truth. I'll say that again. The gospel is the word of truth. Ephesians 1 and 13. The gospel is the word of truth. So when we preach, we preach the word of truth. Jesus is truth. And the Holy Ghost is the spirit of truth. Number four. Holy Ghost is another comforter, John 14 and 16. I already brought that to you, that the term and other means of the same substance. Number five, the Holy Ghost is a teacher. He is a teacher. Yes, he has a chalkboard, chalk, and no eraser because he doesn't make a mistake. So the Holy Ghost is a teacher, John 14 and 16. I can't wait either, my sister. Matthew, uh, John 14 and 6, 26. I saw Matthew Sellers join. Hey, Matthew. Number six, the Holy Ghost brings all things to our remembrance. John 14 and 26. So far, we've determined that the Holy Ghost is not an it, but the Holy Ghost is a he. The Holy Ghost is not just an influence, but the Holy Ghost is a person. And a person is any entity that has a mind that has a thought, that has knowledge, that has emotions. And we read where the Holy Ghost has love. We read where the Holy Ghost has a will. We read where the Holy Ghost has a knowledge or has knowledge. We read where the Holy Ghost has thoughts. And we read where the Holy Ghost speaks. So which means the Holy Ghost is a person. He is not, does not have a body, a physical form, but he is a person person thank God for the thumbs up he is a person number seven the Holy Ghost testifies of Jesus John 15 and 26 anything the Holy Ghost says is going to always be about Jesus so for those of you who have the precious gift of the Holy Ghost and you're always glorifying yourself if every word comes at your mouth is all about the leader mm, 
check yourself, my brother and my sister, because uh, the Holy Ghost testifies of Jesus and not of himself. A, he bears witness to who Jesus is. B, he helps us bear witness about Jesus to others. So the Holy Ghost causes us to be effective when we minister to other people about Jesus. He will tell you what to say. and All you got to do is listen to what he tells you to speak to that person. You don't even need a prescript. You don't even need schooling. The Holy Ghost will tell you what to say that very hour and then bring conviction upon the person who you're speaking to. Number eight, the Holy Ghost convicts, John 16 and 8. A, he convicts us because of sin. B, he reveals that we are sinners. C, he reveals that we need to be saved from sin. D, he reveals that we need a Savior. E, he reveals to us who the Savior is. And F, he empowers us to believe and accept Jesus as our Savior. That's John 1 and 12. G, we then become the sons of God. Number nine. If you need me to go over that, we'll probably go over it next time or next week. Number nine, the Holy Ghost frees us from the power of sin. Romans 6 and 18 says, being then made free from sin. The Holy Ghost and only the Holy Ghost can empower us to be free from sin. Which means once you give your life over to the Lord and allow the Lord to dictate to you what to do, empower him to move in your life. He'll bring conviction. He'll bring healing and he'll give you a new mind. He'll show you a new way. I looked at my hands and they look new. I looked at my eyes and they did too. And it's not because you got new prescriptions, but he calls you to see things with the same eyes, but with a different view, a different angle. Even your enemy, you begin to love them instantaneously. Yes. You fall in love with your enemy because of the love of God. The Bible says God is love. He is love. And the minute you receive God into your life, you have love in your life. You ain't got to struggle with it. The reason why we struggle with so much is because we refuse to allow the love of God to work in our lives. Come on, y'all. Be honest. If I got a reader, say I agree. Just type I agree. Am I right about it? The reason why we struggle with things in doing some work for God is because we just refuse to allow the Holy Ghost to take place. You and we ourselves know that we have wrestled with things where the Holy Spirit was pricking our hearts or bringing con- conviction in us, trying to get us to stop, to move, to turn around, to forgive. But we just said, no, Holy Ghost, let me handle this. All right. Number 10, the Holy Ghost will guide us into all truth. John 16 and 13. Number 11, the Holy Ghost will glorify Jesus. John 16 and 14. He will glorify Jesus. John 16 and 14. Number 12, the Holy Ghost will show you things to come. It don't supposed to take you by surprise. He will show you. If we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, he will show us the things to come. My uncle, the late Dr. John Albert Jones said, Nothing y'all do surprises me. It's because the Holy Ghost brings it to his understanding of what's going to take place. Number 13, the Holy Ghost forms Jesus in our hearts. He forms him in our heart. Ephesians, the third chapter and the 16th verse. The Holy Ghost, he forms Jesus in our heart. He literally forms him and shapes him. And then he puts that little intricate piece of cloth that we wear. What would Jesus do? He puts that in our heart and he forms it in our hearts and he shows us this is what Jesus would do. All you have to do is give it over to him and let him work. Number 14, I'll stop here. The Holy Ghost make intercession for us. Romans 8 and 26. Okay, I'm going to give you one more. Number 15, 
The Holy Ghost reveals to us the plan of God for us. 1 Corinthians 2 and 10 and verse 12. He reveals to us the plan of God for us. I'm going to stop right there. There is something else I want to say about the Holy Ghost. Hey, my sister, First Lady Miggins. That's my mama from Bible Way Church of God in Christ. There's something else I want to say about the Holy Ghost, and we'll talk about that maybe if we have time later. The Holy Ghost will call you into ministry. He will tell you where to go to minister. So for us who's struggling where we are, you may be struggling because you are where the Holy Ghost don't want you to be. You want to talk about that? Maybe we'll talk about that when we come back. What do you mean? The Holy Ghost called me to preach. Yes, he did. But how come I'm not effective where I am? Mm, maybe he don't want you where you are. Maybe he wants you somewhere else. I got to go. This is the Sir Walter Jones Show. That's Sir Walter Jones. That's his co-host, Dr. Alvin Carter, pointing at one another. We pray his grace that he make it back here safe and in the center of the will of God. Facebook. I love y'all. It's been a pleasure talking to you all. Let's bring back the teaching of the Holy Ghost back to into our churches. And let's not grieve him. Let's subject to our, him to ourselves. Y'all know what I'm saying. Talk to y'all later.
You have been listening to the Sir Walter Jones Show, where Sir Walter Jones provides you with a biblical perspective on everyday life. Stay connected to Sir Walter Jones at his website, www.sirwalterjones.com. Search the Sir Walter Jones Show on Facebook or follow on Twitter at Sir Walter's Music. Until next time, thank you for listening to the Sir Walter Jones Show with Sir Walter Jones. Hey, ladies and gents, if you missed any of today's show, head to Spreaker.com and search the Sir Walter Jones Show and listen to this show and past shows. Now, remember, search for the Sir Walter Jones Show on Spreaker.com. That's Spreaker spelled S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. And enjoy. Thank you, Mr. Walters. Mm.